Joining us now is our Niger wife, Vimbai Muntiri Ekwenyongkinum. We are very well pleased. Very well pleased. Good <laughs> <laughs> stories trending around the world. Hello, Vimbai. Hello, Dr. Thank God it's Friday. Yeah, thank God it's Friday. Good morning, Dr. Bati. Good morning, Ayo. Good morning, Rufai. Today we're the blue crowd. Yeah, <laughs> yes, so Rufai came so and uh, carried my babies for a few hours yesterday. Oh. So that was very he's nice of him. He's uh, practicing. He's practicing. And can I just say, he's very ready for the task. <laughs> he's up to it. Well, I hope so. Very good task. Choo choo. All these bachelors. Shout out to you, Choo Choo. <laughs> Go come see your play. Who you up? <laughs> exactly. Uh, that's exactly how she does it. Let's get straight into what's trending because we have so many stories to handle today. And uh, we start what's trending today with breaking news. Gunmen have kidnapped a journalist and reporter with Channel's Television, Mr. Joshua Rogers, at his residence in Rumosi in Obio Akbo local government area of River State. And this took place on Thursday night. Rogers, who covers the River State Government House for his organization, was reportedly trailed after he closed from work to his residence. The miscreants accosted him before he alighted from his car, pointed a gun at him and whisked him along with his vehicle off to an unknown destination at about 9 p.m. While we continue with uh, stories rela related to insecurity, scores of Nigerians have taken to their social media handles to slam the government and security agencies as a new video has emerged showing alleged bandits in Zamfara State celebrating the recent Eid El Fitri festival. The video, disclosed by a counterinsurgency expert and security analyst focused on the Lake Chad region, that's Zaga Zola Makama, was shared on his X handle on Thursday. The footage showcases alleged bandits partaking in festivities, a stark contrast, of course, to their notorious reputation for violent crimes and kidnappings in the region. Let's take a look. <laughs> Meanwhile, the Nigerian Air Force has bombed three terrorist camps in Zamfara on Wednesday, eliminating several of them and their structures. In a statement, the Director of Information and Public Relations of the Nigerian Air Force, Edward Gabkett, said the strikes followed carefully conducted observation missions over the camps of terrorist kingpins Abdullahi Nasanda in Zurmi local government area and Malam Tukur's camp in Gusal, LGA of the state. He said that intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance missions conducted on Abdullahi Nasanda's camp revealed terrorist activities around some huts and thatched roof structures. Now, finally, as we conclude uh, our roundup of some of the top stories trending in insecurity issues, in a concerning move of transparency, journalists have been barred from covering the military inquiry into the Okwama killings. This decision has raised questions about the openness of the investigation. Now, we know that the Ijo Youth Council in the Niger Delta has sounded the alarm over the alleged invasion of homes belonging to prominent Ijo leaders and sons. They claim that the Nigerian army's actions, including allegations of arrests without proper explanations, have sparked outcry in their communities. They highlighted the case of an Ijo leader, that's Chief Sob Sobomoba Jack Rich, also known as Egberi Papa, who was arrested after his home was raided by soldiers. Two of his aides were reportedly also killed during this operation, and calls for Jack Rich's immediate release have intensified amidst growing concerns over military actions in the region. So a lot to unpack there from various parts of the country uh, and a lot to react to. Uh, I'll start with you, Rufai. I mean, so a couple of things to react to. Number one is that video that you showed about uh, bandits, you know, celebrating Salah Eid. Um, if it's, because I know that handle, he says he's been following the security situation and he posts videos. If that's been independently verified, so I ask them, now why serve God when you perpetrate evil and crime to other people and you make them cry and you make them sad? Uh, what does God that you serve teach? Does it teach in humanity to your fellow man or it teaches peace and love at this point in time? And that's why I tell people we should be careful in this life. Let's not mix religion with things like that. So anyway, but they still have a right of their religion 
And somebody will want to ask, why are the security forces, if they have intels like this, or do they have intels like this, not go after them and sweep them? And it's shocking how much of the ecosystem we've built. Look at a lot of people here. I used to have them in their thousands. What are we doing that is making it easy for these people to recruit one another? That's the sad reality we should look at. So I think it's just a reminder of the kind of society we've built. And if something is not done about it, it will just persist that way. And I just hope it doesn't consume all of us someday soon. I think another story you made mention of uh, was the Okwama situation. I think to a large extent at this point in time, the military should be ready to hand themselves over for an investigative panel of inquiry in the frame of like answers into what is happening. Because we are seeing a continuation of actions. Some poor communities were attacked. And the military at the same time says it's trying to set up a panel of inquiry to look into this. It can't be a judge in his own matter. Let us really know what happened, the remote causes, and other causes of this action. Now we're talking about Jack Rich. There are other people too that have been extended. I'm probably sure, if my memory is right, I don't think Jack Rich's face or name was part of the, the initial list wanted. From there too, we all remember how they went to attack uh, Paike Clark's home. So we are seeing a lot of fishing activity going on. But what we just want is, you know, an independent inquiry into this to really know what happened. Because we all remember how Odi ended. Despite the justifications, we all remember that the federal government, I think it's them, Dr. Abbas's government that served in, had to pay some sort of uh, compensation after the court had ruled. Because we are violating people's rights at this point in time. The Yoruba Progress Union had spoken at nauseam about this. The military cannot be a judge and jury in their own matter. And I think all of this should stop because the Niger Delta is already inflamed. I'm not saying action should not be carried out to read out banditry and criminality, but also let's ask the state vital questions. In the, big of, in the bid of bringing peace to that area, these actors, as regards the insecurity of this area, that the state also empowers with contracts and things like that, is it the time to ask ourselves questions? And that's why it goes back to the real conversation of how we should have developed the Niger Delta with a resource that we have not done over these years that is now coming back to haunt us. Let us think deeply. It's teaching time, they say saves nine. All right, I'm so sad that we have to start on a very downer note on a Friday, but it, these are very pertinent conversations we must have, especially with regards to the state of insecurity. Um, side by side, the fact that this administration has consistently said that they are working to kick out um, banditry, kidnapping, and we hear one of our colleagues in this regard, um, the staff of Channels TV, um, Joshua. Rogers, who was kidnapped. And it's a developing story. It's just come out. We hear that they are demanding an amount, a, a significant amount for his ransom. And I'm hoping that the security agencies will act really fast because it's not just a threat on this individual, but it also speaks to his um, to his um, profession as well. Um, I mean, there are no links as to the reason why, whether he was picked up deliberately, whether he was targeted. They did say they trailed him. But just to say that, I hope this is a, this is a call for the real state police command to fish out the kidnappers and bring him back safely. But beyond that, it's also to talk about the fact that the bandits in Zamfara, as if the like um, the video that was shown, if if accurate, then are depriving people from enjoying the same things that they're enjoying, and that is hypocritical. If they're saying that they, they adhere to a certain faith and they are able to celebrate that faith, they are members of people in their custody who are of the same faith, who do not have the freedom to do the same. Hypocritical. And that's why I believe very strongly that when it comes to issues like this, we should have spirit, religious leaders speak up and condemn the actions of bandits. Not talk about negotiating with them, protecting them or uh, humanizing them, but to speak against the criminality of banditry. I think it's important that whilst the government is doing their own part, religious leaders, it's their own. I wish on that day the sermon or the preacher or the, um, the, the, what was preached about was the importance of or, the, or condemning criminality. It's very important. Every one of us was, must work hand in hand to, to ensure that we keep Nigeria safe. It's very sad. And it's amazing how there are videos that come up like this of bandits, whether celebrating or rejoicing, and we cannot apprehend them. We cannot arrest them. It, it's suspect. Mm. Okay, these stories are so many. Yeah. It looked like you were reading news yeah. uh, to me. <laughs> but let me see which of those uh, stories that I could uh, treat. 
The first one about the uh, journalist that was abducted. Now, that's very sad to hear uh, because it looks like journalists are under assault. There is a threat to journalism in Nigeria. One report said so. That Nigeria is one of those you know, countries where it's become very difficult for journalists to practice. And it's unfortunate that this will be happening under a Chinubu administration, under a president who, of course, understands the power, the relevance uh, of the media, being himself a major player in that space. Most recently, it was uh, Shegun Latunji, uh, editor of First News, who was uh, abducted uh, by uh, you know, security operatives, and he spent about two weeks there for reasons you know, that people are still arguing about. And now we're told that a channel's uh, reporter has also been abducted. The Committee for the Protection of Journalists, or to Protect Journalists, CPJ, as it is otherwise known, does an annual report on assault on journalists in different parts of the world. And I think that government has a responsibility to defend the right of the media under the Constitution, sections 22 and 39 thereof, which says, look, we're part of this uh, estate and we do our job. We're not supposed to be harassed. That's one point. The second story is the uh, story of the uh, military investigating in uh, Okwama and, and into the killings. Yes, we are told that there's a fact-finding uh, team of the military that is already on the ground there. The people of Okoloba community showed up, but the chiefs of Okwama said that they've not been invited. Now, the story that was put out there was that this is a conflict between Okoloba community and uh, Okwama uh, you know, uh, uh, community. Now, I don't know what fact finding the military is doing if they are not going to hear from the other side. Why was the Okwama community excluded if indeed they were excluded? Because uh, what is the principle in law? It says, how the other pattern, you must hear the other side. So for that fact finding uh, 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 business uh, to have a uh, meaning, they must hear the other side too. So I think that the Okwama community, they also have to be listened to. However, the Joint Youth Council is saying that, look, the people of those communities have been hounded. They have been harassed. And that's where the point comes up to say that the military cannot be the judge, the jury, and the prosecutor in the matter. And that's why, you know, people have called for an independent panel of inquiry to ensure that there is fairness. However, again, let's go to the point about journalists. We were told that in this uh, fact finding mission of the military, journalists have been excluded. And uh, we were told that this one character in, uh, in uh, you know, Delta State Government that says journalists are not welcome. No, that's an irresponsible thing for that particular uh, officer in the government house of uh, Delta State uh, to do. And the governor must uh, ensure, if indeed this was the doing, of the data uh, state government, that journalists are allowed to be there Absolutely. for purposes of transparency and accountability. That's right. There are two things, the right to know, the need to know. In fact, in what has happened in uh, data state, we, the people of Nigeria, we have the right to know. We have the need to know. Yeah. They cannot conduct a fact-finding uh, process uh, in secret. Yes. And that's why journalists must immediately be allowed to attend that fact-finding process so that they can report not just to the data state people, but to all of us. Yes. Number three, I said you, you, you brought news. So you, <laughs> it's a lot of you, stories. You might as well wait for me to deal with another okay. important one, which is, uh, you know, the uh, Nigerian Air Force, you know, say where they, they were able to decimate some camps in the uh, Zamfara uh, state. Yes, well, each time we have the... Uh, uh, military doing well, reducing the population of the emergent uh, Taliban population in Nigeria. Uh, we commend them. And it was uh, Air Commodore, uh, or, or is it Air Vice Marshal? It's not UVM. It used to be a Commodore, you know, a uh, Gapquet, uh, who uh, issued the, that uh, release. So we commend them. We expect them to do more while we commend them. There was a story about some people called terrorists 
That's Mwanye uh, community in Sanfara. Well, if you looked at uh, those, uh, that video again, this was an entire community, men, women, children. So I don't know how anybody arrived at the fact that an entire community is a community of, uh, of terrorists. Mm. So we also must avoid the error of mischaracterization, of yes. labeling. So to say, oh, a terrorist uh, celebrating uh, either future. Okay, who arrived at the conclusion that mm. that entire community is a community of terrorists? Absolutely. So these Very are well put, issues we, we should watch out for. Thank you so much uh, for that, Dr. Abati. And now let's take a look at more stories trending. The family of the late former chairman of the Nigerian Exchange Group, that's Abimbola Ogumbajo, has sued a U.S. company over the helicopter crash that killed him, as well as the Access Bank Group CEO, Herbert Wigwe, his wife and son. Ogumbajo's family is filing for wrongful death and negligence in the crash and are seeking a jury trial and payment for his funeral expenses. His family says the flight should have been grounded because of potentially bad weather ahead. They say the charter company Orbic Air LLC flew the helicopter despite a mix of snowy and rainy conditions in the Mojave Desert where the crash occurred on February 9. Rob and Rob, the law firm representing Ogumbajo's family, previously represented Vanessa Bryant in her lawsuit following Kobe Bryant's fatal helicopter crash in 2020. This lawsuit is being filed in San Bernardino County Superior Court. And of course, the cause of the crash is continues to be investigated. Um, Ayo, very quickly, so we can take more stories. All right, yeah, so uh, already we had mentioned that, that there was an announcement that they would um, investigate well, the, on, the, on the US side of things. But the f family members have taken it further to actually seek redress in court, saying that there was some sort of negligence, as you've mentioned. And I think that's quite fine, because when it comes to deaths like this, there's always a need for closure. And sometimes finding that closure and being able to prevent such an incident from happening again must lead to to a proper investigation that's also um, sought in the, in, in the courts. And if they're found culpable, then what it would mean, I don't think the families are after the money. I mean, they're very well to do. It's really about justice and, and possibly an open door to closure as well. And if it's possible to prevent this kind of accident from happening, because it shows that, you know, we talk about Nigeria, the um, safety in the air, but also to find that developed and a forward thinking country like the United States of America would allow uh, an, a helicopter to fly in such harsh conditions, weather conditions, and also that night vision. So I, I'm, I'm looking, I hope that they will be able to say, see this process to the end. And if found culpable, they ought to pay. They ought okay, to pay. This is a, a legal matter. It's called an action in thought. Many years ago, I was taught uh, law of thoughts by Mama Susu, Professor A.B. Uh, Susu. And in thought, you look for certain things. You look for negligence. You look for intentional thought. You look for strict liability. I hope I still remember what I learned in all of thoughts. And that's what the Ogumbanjo family is going to seek. And they are very deliberate. They are correct in this regard. And they are saying that that airline, Obic Air, should not have uh, flown the uh, helicopter when there was a wintry, snowy weather, you know, so their, their council is going to push for negligence and push for strict liability. But what can they get at the end of the day? Compensation. Okay, so Doesn't bring maybe him back. monetary compensation, mm -hmm. but the tragedy remains. Absolutely. You know, a very uh, noble person, an important man, a valuable member of family and society died. Maybe the Wigwes will also sue, you know, uh, under strict liability rule in uh, law of thoughts, but again, we are left with a tragedy, with the lives that we lost, which is most unfortunate. Absolutely. Uh, and now, of course, to a story that is trending worldwide. Could O.J. Simpson's infamous 1995 trial be credited with the creation of reality, reality TV? Be, yes. Well, the jury is still out about whether O.J. Simpson will be remembered as a hero or a villain after he succumbed to a battle against cancer on Thursday. But the conversation has turned to how millions were glued to their screens as cameras followed the infamous Ford Bronco down the Los Angeles interstate in a car chase and trial that redefined live TV broadcasts until 
final date. Uh, now, of course, we've already, earlier in the show, you already looked at the various reactions uh, from different people, of course, uh, notably black community and white community. But, uh, you know, very quick uh, input from you, Rafai, about uh, what, how this has impacted how we've opened up courtrooms, especially even here in Nigeria, to yeah. live broadcast. Yeah. You know, can we give them the credit for that? I mean, we'll give... O.J. Simpson's trial revolutionized TV and sort of like segued us into the social media generation. And I hold that view that it actually helped open up the reality TV sector. Because prior to that time, I have not seen anything that was as widespread when the chase was on, when it was beamed on television, and it was confirmed there was O.J. Simpson that was in that front bronco. And then the trial that went on almost every morning was on CNN and the likes. You know, there are many shows that revolutionized, you know, reality TV. Then there was the Jerry Springer show era. There was O.J. Simpson's Jerry Springer show. I remember then people that couldn't have cable to watch, they would buy the video tape, video cassettes of episodes of Jerry Springer put together. And this even gave birth to what I call the era of Kardashianism. Of course. Because... The, the patriarch of the Kardashian family was also in this trial. And we can see the many spin-offs that happen from them. So we cannot deny the fact that O.J. Simpson revolutionized TV and that appetite never you know, came down. It only grew when in the early 2000s, the likes of Endemol now started interaction on TV. People live Big Brother that you were part of at some wow, point take us back there. many years ago. And... That also grew into what, it's, what it is, the reality TV, reality TV stars. and everything. I think O.J. Simpson, apart from the fact that he had clout prior to now as a national hero, was one of the first real reality TV stars. And you can see how he polarized efforts. And also, we'll also give kudos to the likes of Oprah Winfrey Show, too. You know, that was a bastion of television, too, then. While yeah, we're yeah. talking entertainment, I'm so sorry to cut you off, but while we're talking in entertainment, let's round up what's trending on a heartwarming note. Residents of Kanak, UK, were treated to a burst of musical magic as a group of Nigerians brought the streets to life with a spontaneous praise and worship session. The lively gathering filled the air with melodious tunes and infectious positivity, spreading smiles and uplifting spirits of all around. Let's take a look. <laughs> Because it's a Friday, yes. and the, well, a lot of heavy stories, so let's also sub Love celebrate it. the yes. beauty of the Nigerian spirit yes. anywhere Love in the it. world. Yeah. <laughs> I was dancing, I forgot myself for a second. Uh, uh, that song was by Chema Jizo, so yeah. let's give her her credit. Yeah. So beyond yeah. the beauty of taking the Nigerian spirit out there, is also being able to in introduce our own artists to the rest of the world. Yeah. And I heard, I, I saw people writing that, oh, we're taking our noise, da, 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 da. this happens all the time. Everywhere. And usually you get permits, everywhere. yes. Yeah. You get permits, it's allowed. There are buskers on the streets of yeah. England. So there's nothing illegal about this. I participated in some of this when I was in uni as well. Yeah. So it's always great at, and it builds community spirit and just that sense of home, you know, home there. So kudos to them and thank you for livening up our Friday morning. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> well, I, I thought uh, they said in Dabuski. <laughs> He's in London. He's also abroad. <laughs> I, I was looking out for him there, you know. The Abuski Sheka. Anyway. Thank you very much, our wife. <laughs> and that's all on today's edition of The Morning Show.